John, uh, when I looked at his website, I think is the author of 15 books, I counted. Um, I counted Lynn being the author of 14 books, but she's got one coming out, so maybe it's going to be even. That's, that's in... Oh, okay, sorry. Oh, you've got a bit of catching up to do. Anyway, John's the author of uh, 15 books. Uh, I have one of those at home. It's called The Big Book. Is that what it's called? The Big Picture Book. That's a children's book. I bought it for my daughter, but I've read it, uh, but I don't know that she has. Um, <laughs> it's pretty easy to read. I was able to manage it. The other thing, John, I'll just give the, the plug, a plug for John's latest book. It's called Swimming in Stone. The Amazing Go-Go Fossils of the Kimberley. Uh, and there are copies for sale upstairs. There's been a bookstore here and it's for sale um, in the museum. But there are, are actually signed copies still available upstairs. Um, and uh, this is a fabulous book. This amazing story, Long Chronicles, the history of the sites and takes the reader on a journey of adventure, human endeavour and intrigue and along the way shares with us his insights into the very nature of scientific study. That sounds pretty good. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome uh, Dr John Long, who's going to talk about the fossil record, What Gaps. Thanks, Terry. I'm really glad I can help the sceptics. I think what work you guys do is absolutely admirable and outstanding. And same with the science talent search. I meant to sort of say that I was a a three times winner of the science talent search when I was a kid at school in Victoria. I won one prize actually with Tim Flannery in 1971 and basically it was the only encouragement I got as a school kid in terms of getting a slap on the back for science because all the other kids at school, captain of the cricket team, captain of the football team, got huge trophies you know but when you win the state of Victoria top science prize you know you get a little clap and that's it. So I mean I think the science talent search is absolutely fantastic and um, I was very pleased to be able to support it in West Australia. We had a prize for evolution for primary and secondary schools and I'm hoping maybe if I can talk to some of you guys later we can get that instigated through Museum Victoria again sometime. But what I'm going to talk about today is good old-fashioned evolution, fossil record. Um, obviously you know being purely skeptical I can't talk about all aspects of the fossil record we would be here for weeks and clearly there are still a lot of gaps in the fossil record. When we come to invertebrates and soft-bodied animals they just don't preserve well. So there will always be those sort of glaring gaps in the fossil record due to the nature of preservation. So what I'd like to focus on today is just a couple of examples from the evolution of vertebrates, the backboned animals that you and I belong to, to show how historically gaps or missing links in the fossil record have been completely smoothed over and filled in through remarkable new recent fossil discoveries and also by a new tool, the advent of highly advanced technology. We're using the world's finest CT scanners and even synchrotrons now to analyse fossils and that's part of the project I've been working on here at Museum Victoria which I'll be showing you. So what you see there is not a bird, it's a dinosaur. If you want to call it a bird you can but you'd be wrong. It's a dinosaur. It's just a dinosaur with feathers. Now we'll get to that a bit later. I'll just a bit of a background first. You know fossils and evolution. Fossils are the remains of past life on the earth. They can be bones, they can be plants, they can be wood, they can be footprints or traces, they can be feces, they can be bioorganic molecules, ancient DNA, they can be take all sorts of different you know, forms and fashions. Um, some of them are, are quite spectacular, like this go-go fish, which is actually on display above me and was published in a paper in Nature only last week, filling in gaps about the evolution of the first land animals. Or this early land plant from Ye in Victoria, which is one of the oldest complete land plants known in the world, Paragornathia. Victoria is blessed with a wonderful fossil record, by the way. The other thing, just to point out quickly that the creationists and the people, you know, proponents of intelligent design would always be jumping up and down about the dating of fossils. Well, again, through the advances of technology, the myriad of different dating techniques we've got now, radioactive dating, isotopic dating, as well as um, uh, biostratigraphical relative dating, fossils anywhere in the world can be dated quite accurately, usually to within one or two or three percent of their absolute age. 
And indeed, fossils are used in the oil industry when they put bores down to get the age of the strata. And if they weren't valuable in that economic contents, context, and they weren't reliable in terms of their dating and their uh, relative uh, height in the stratigraphic column, they wouldn't be economically useful to the petroleum industry. But they obviously are. So that means the fossil record and their, their dating is quite a proven um, sort of uh, system. A little bit about fossils and evolution before I, I talk about missing links. And we've known about fossils for centuries. Uh, they, people were not stupid. You know, they saw the remains of a bird or a lizard in the rock. They thought it was the remain of an animal. You know, other people invented stories like, you know, the devil created them or whatever. But common sense scientists and philosophers knew for many centuries that they were the remains of, pre, of former life. They just didn't know how old that life was. Um, this specimen here is a, a flying reptile, a pterosaur, from the famous Solenhofen sites in Germany. And um, these were described back in 1784 by Cosimo Collini, who knew that they were a form of flying reptile. You know, you didn't and I have, only have to put two and two together, and you can see that the skeleton of this animal is very much like a reptile, but it's got wings, so it probably flew or, or, or was a glider. In Darwin's day, though, and especially when he wrote Origin of the Species, in 18, published in 1859, but he was deliberating on it for decades before, there were relatively few fossils in museums around the world. And this is another thing that creationists and intelligent designers tend to pick up on, or the, the one thing they hone in on is that, you know, you, you have a fossil out of place, therefore the whole fossil record is unreliable. In reality, today, um, I would argue that there are over a billion fossils in museums and university and private collections around the world. This museum alone where you're sitting has over three and a half million fossil specimens in its, in its vast vaults which cover half the basement of the Royal Exhibition Building. You go to the Australian Museum in Sydney, the West Australian Museum, Australia alone there's probably something like 20 million fossils in collections registered or registered as lots. Now you go to the big museums around the world, the big universities, and you can come up with a figure like a billion specimens quite easily. If one of those specimens, one in a billion, was out of place contextually in its stratigraphy, you might have a case, but you don't. There isn't one out of the whole lot. We do have fossils that are sometimes reworked. In other words, they come from the Cretaceous, the age of dinosaurs, they're eroded out and they're redeposited in younger sediments. But any good geologist worth his salt can tell a Romanier fossil or something that's been reworked and redeposited. The bottom line is we have a database of a billion pieces of evidence that the fossil record is irrefutable. And I let that stand. But getting back to Darwin, if we look at when, when he wrote his theory of evolution, he didn't need fossils. Fossils were irrelevant. They were a little bit like the icing on the cake. I mean, the early intermediate fossil humans, for example, like Mrs. Plez, um, discovered in a cave, South Africa, 1947, a, a lovely first complete skull of a sort of an intermediate form. You know, prior to that, there was the Tuang skull, um, the Raymond Dart had described, but there just weren't many examples. Now, you know, you ask someone like Colin Groves, who's here today, about the fossil record of humans, which I'm not going to talk about because it's uh, not my subject. And there is virtually every step along the way you could, you could possibly hope for. But more than that, it's not a linear progression. It shows the real nature of evolution in having sidelines and offshoots and, and dead ends, as well as the main steps leading up to modern Homo sapiens sapiens. So if we look at the evolution of life in a, in a broad picture book scale, and I, I could plug my book, The Big Picture Book, for kids because it's evolution reduced down to a haiku or a Zen minimalism. There's no big words in it. It's, it's for primary kids to understand that evolution is something that's happened and not trying to justify it or explain it. Just say, this is what's happened. And this is what I'm presenting here, that the spiral of life. And we're going to look at a couple of key evolutionary transitions today, both of which have got stunning new evidence that just fills in all the gaps you'd possibly want. Um, I'll first of all, say the origin of vertebrates going back 530 million years to the, the base of the Cambrian. We've now got about half a dozen different fish from this age, from China, such as this funny looking smudge on a rock. But when you look at it under a microscope, which I have, it's actually got vertebrae, it's got gill pouches, a notochord, muscles, and fin rays. And there's, you know, everything you'd want in a fish. So vertebrates first appear half a billion years ago. Um, the big 
step in evolution, the one I like to think is the most important transition, was the fish tetrapod transition. Because you think about it for two seconds. If you're going from a fish in water that's breathing through its gills and it's got fins, to go to a land living animal with arms and legs breathing air, it's a pretty major transition. And it is hailed as one of the big phases of evolution that we need to grasp if you really want to understand evolution you know, in, in its basic form. So that's one we're going to look at later. And the other one, which is just a lovely and delightful one because of its historical links back to T.H. Huxley, is the dinosaur bird transition, the origin of modern birds. Humans, of course, appear much later up here. Okay, missing links. Now, these were always the, um, the thing that people were touting as filling in a gap between you know, major groups of organisms. The first and most famous of all missing links is undoubtedly Archaeopteryx this specimen found in Germany, and this one was the Berlin Archaeopteryx. Um, there's about eight or nine specimens of Archaeopteryx now. Modern anatomists look at the skeleton of Archaeopteryx and say, it's a dinosaur. There's, there's very little that tells you it's a bird, apart from the fact it's got feathers. And in the, the early days of its discovery, um, Archaeopteryx was deemed to be a great missing link between reptiles and birds by people like Thomas Henry Huxley, because it had the skeleton of a reptile, the feathers of a bird, and clearly it looked like something that could fly. For the um, more devout amongst the anatomists of the day, like Sir Richard Owen, he just said, nah, it's a bird. So when he asked, well, what about a bird with an entirely reptilian skeleton or an entirely reptilian tail, he said, oh, well, God made it that way. Don't question it. And that was the excuse of the day. Um, Huxley was the first person to actually point out that Birds probably evolved from dinosaurs, a particular group of extinct reptile that dominated the earth for about 160 million years and reached gigantic proportions and, and, and radiated into many different forms. But the stunning new evidence comes from China, from Liao Ning. And I was over at the uh, International Paleontological Congress in Beijing earlier this year in June and there was a whole all-day session on the Liaoning biota, and it just blew me away. So what you're going to see now, uh, things mostly published and some unpublished work, but I'm going to try and fill in all those steps between dinosaurs and birds for you based on absolutely brilliant new fossil discoveries. And we're talking about 120 to 130 million years ago. That's called the early Cretaceous. Uh, and we're talking China. Now, this is the current... It's very complex, but current phylogeny of the evolution of dinosaurs to birds, just in terms of a general pattern. All you need to know is that above the screen, above the word bird, we have all these different families of dinosaurs. And below the word bird, uh, we have a few dinosaurs, uh, mostly dinosaurs, and just birds as one small group in there. So this shows you that basically the way scientists accept it, birds are nestled within, strongly within a clade of dinosaurs and now is to pr 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 provide the evidence and information to support it. Well, the first thing was feathers, because up until 1996, we didn't have any feathered dinosaurs. In fact, I wrote a, a children's book called The Mystery of Devil's Roost, which came out in 1997, and um, it's about kids going back in time and you know, walking through dinosaur-infested forests in Australia. And when the book was just going to publication, I said to the artist, put feathers on the dinosaur, put feathers on. So there's like a Tyrannosaurus on the cover with feathers coming off its head. And the moment the book was published in early 1997, the very first paper came out, Feathered Dinosaurs from China. And I'm going to show you all of these. And when we talk about feathers, you've got to also think that things like feathers evolve. They don't just appear as flight feathers on a dinosaur. They go through various phases. And these are some of the phases that have been documented based on the fossils I'm about to show you. So we've got carnosaurs down the bottom are our big ugly mates like Tyrannosaurus and Allosaurus. And they have like a skin which is largely reptilian. Then we have this group, the Compsognathids, which those of you that saw Jurassic Park, the compies that jumped up and down and bit people, they actually are the beginnings of small feather-like structures coming out of that reptilian skin, which I'll show you in a minute. And then as we go up to these more advanced dinosaur groups, we see simple feather-like structures appearing on these dinosaurs. And finally, with birds right at the top, we get true, well-formed flight feathers. And that is a speciality of birds that dinosaurs don't have. So when we say feathers, I'm not just talking about any old feathers. I'm talking about different kinds of feathers and evolution of feathers in terms of their step-by-step -step evolution and, and progression. 
The exceptional discoveries coming out of China are only made possible because it was an ancient lake deposit. Creatures died at the bottom of this lake. They were covered over by sediment forming. It was anaerobic at the bottom. There was no scavenging or no things tearing them apart. And this most amazing, um, you know, fine preservation ensued. So this is a summary of eight different kinds of dinosaurs, all meat-eating dinosaurs, theropods, that all have feathers. And I'm going to take you through them one by one and show you some details. The first one that turned up, and this was published in Science originally, I think about 1996, and in Nature in 1998, uh, a thing called Cynoceropteryx. And here we see the specimen on the left, and it's got like, like hairs coming down the body and the tail, tufts on the tail. Um, there's been several of them found since then. There's not just one, there's about three or four of them. And they do have th simple hair-like feathers covering the body. We have another group called the Ovaraptorids. And again, there's a specimen from the Ao Ning, and we have a nice chagrin of feathers over here to the uh, top left, showing the feathers are actually starting to, to sort of separate as barbed sort of feathers or similar to down feathers that you get on, on baby geese and ducks that keep them warm. Cordoteryx is was the second of these feathered non-avian theropods reported from China and it's a beautiful animal. It's even got tail feathers uh, coming out as a fan, feathers covering all parts of the body and quite large feathers on the arms. So it's clearly a dinosaur. It was a hunting predatory dinosaur. Its skeletal anatomy is identical to any other dinosaur, but it's got this wonderful covering of feathers adorning the, the entire body. The next group are the Jurassic Park raptors, the velociraptors, what we call in scientific jargon the dromaeosaurids. And there's several of these now being discovered with feathers. And most of these are very recent discoveries, all within the last five years or so. Sinonithosaurus is a bit of a jumbled up specimen there, but nonetheless you can really clearly see near where the scale bar is, quite nice tufts of, of feathers preserved in this beautiful lithographic shale which preserves even the most incredibly fine detail of insect wings and things like that. So reconstructed, Sinonithosaurus is one of these predatory running dinosaurs. It's got longer arms than the previous dinosaurs, arms that are long enough almost to be wings, but not quite. Um, if the feathers were just a little bit more developed, this thing probably could have, might have been able to glide from leaping out of trees and things. We've also got some amazing creatures, the four-winged dinosaurs. Microraptor, beautifully preserved here, shows a complete adornment of feathers, not only on the arms, but also on the legs and also on the tail. I'm pointing out that this is not in any way, shape or fashion a bird either. Birds, in terms of the modern birds, have a discrete set of skeletal features that uniquely define them as modern birds. This is a dinosaur with feathers. That's all it is. Some of these uh, were also arboreal dinosaurs that had adaptations for climbing. The hooked claw in Velociraptor, people think, was probably an adaptation now uh, for climbing up on the back of prey so they could bite them on the back and the neck. Um, rather than necessarily being able to disembowel a larger animal. They did experiments with the claw and with dead pigs and things, and they found out that the claw couldn't actually puncture the skin uh, for, the, for the force a velociraptor could exhibit and actually disembowel an animal. So these mechanical uh, studies were done and published recently, only 2005, actually showed that the most practical use for a velociraptor claw was to, to leap up and climb the back of a larger animal where they could inflict wounds without being attacked. And that's one step away from climbing up a tree, and that's one step away from gliding. If we look at the birds from Liaoning, we have a huge range of fossil birds, all beautifully preserved, complete specimens with feathers, tail feathers like this Confucius ornus, some with the stomach contents preserved like this G-hole ornus which had the seeds in its belly, um, others even with, with colour banding and, and sort of faint pigments preserved on some of the feathers. We even have four-winged birds. These are not dinosaurs, these are birds because they're starting to show the skeletal adaptations that modern birds have, such as a pygo style and uh, various uh, unique bone combinations. I won't go into the anatomical details, but I'm happy to give these references out. They're all published in Nature or Science in the last couple of years. So there's clearly lots of experimentation going on at that stage. We also have true toothless birds, the modern birds, the ornithuri, 
And, and here's a good, a good example of one. You can even see the little crest preserved above the head and the feathers are beautifully preserved on the arms and the wings, etc. They've even got embryos from Liaoning. They've got embryos of birds, embryos of pterosaurs, embryos of dinosaurs. So you can actually see how the baby bird developed and the primitive conditions in the skeleton that relate back to these dromaeosaurid dinosaurs. So we've got not only all the fossil evidence that's filled in that gap. I mean, if anyone in the audience can think of a stage that's missing between feathered dinosaurs and early birds, please tell me, and we'll go out and find one from Liaoning. <laughs> so that's it. In terms of that evolutionary transition, it's come about largely because of stunning new fossil sites that have been discovered. Also, the way that the fossils were studied. A lot of these were studied with CT scan analysis. So you can go back to those age-old fossils like Archaeopteryx and, uh, and look at the skull in detail through ultrafine CAT scanning anatomy and, uh, and find out how much of a bird or how much of a dinosaur it really is. And the next big step, and I have to sort of quit for a minute because this is very important. Let me escape from this for a, se a second. I'll get back to this one in just a tick. This is one of the most important transitions in the evolution of life. The rhythm of life is a powerful beat With a tingle in your fingers and a tingle in your feet Rhythm in your bed, rhythm in the street Yes, the rhythm of life is a powerful beat And the rhythm of life is a powerful beat With a tingle in your fingers and a tingle in your feet Rhythm in your bed, rhythm in the street Yes, the rhythm of life is a powerful beat Flip your wings and fly to your daddy Take a dive and swim to your daddy Hit the floor and run Here we are. <laughs> right. Okay. Back to the talk. Now, that was worth sort of breaking the talk for a minute, so just give me a sec. But what I'm saying there is that going back to that stage of where fishes evolved into land animals is, is truly a great step. Hold on. Slideshow. Here we go. Uh, sorry. Um, let me go back and go forward just to save time. And right to there, and then we go. Slideshow. Okay. Oh, God. <laughs> All right. Do you mind if I just, I just quickly zap through it? It'll take me a couple of seconds, but I don't know any other way to do it. So You get to see all these wonderful feathered birds. See, aren't they great? There we go. A bit like a creationist argument, a side talk, isn't it, really? They go through things so quickly. All right. Right, there we are. Now, hold on. I don't know what's going wrong here. There we are. So, this is our hero, the first animal, fish, to leave the water and walk on land. Um, again, there's been many new discoveries, stunning discoveries. And most of them have come in the past 20 years, but dare I say, the most significant of them, 99% of them, have come within the last five years. Five years. Most of it's so recent it wouldn't have even gotten into the popular literature. They've nearly filled in all the major gaps now between fishes and early amphibians, and we just need the fine tuning of detail at the family level. To give an example, here's uh, just a, a short part of the early Devonian showing all the different groups of fish filled in by all these forms that come from China, from a remarkable site called in Yunnan, where the Zitun Formation, where we have the beginnings of all the major radiations of fish, the ray fin fishes, the coelacanths, the lungfish, and the groups giving rise to the first land animals, or tetrapods. This is where the red arrow is. But I'm not going to dwell on that, because it's a complex area of science. I'd rather be more entertaining. So we're going to just dwell on one thing, that this was the greatest step in vertebrate evolution, going from water to air aspiring, going from fins to limbs, and going from an aqueous to a terrestrial habitat, which also includes the way you sense the world around you, whether you use a lateral line or whether you use hearing or eyes or smell. And the rapid rates of evolutionary change are clearly demonstrated here. We have a fish here 
And without going into the technical details, all you need to see is this is a fish. It's got large forelimbs or pectoral fins. It's got a pair of pelvic fins. They're the equivalent to arms and legs. It's got no dorsal fins or anal fin. And it's got a whopping great huge head. And if I was to show you the bones of that head, I could tell you that they're one for one. Every bone matches that of an early amphibian, which is an early creature with arms and legs and fingers and toes. So basically, putting it into a distilled form, we've got these advanced fishes with a well-developed skeleton, and then these, this other group called the panderichthyids that have more amphibian-like skulls and longer humerus ulna radius in their fins. And then the only difference going from that fish to that tetrapod is really the development of digits. That is really the only difference to having fingers and toes rather than fin rays on the end of your limbs. Recently, Tiktaalik was described. It made the cover of Nature in April 2006, where two major articles were published, and it really was the last nail in the coffin. It was actually not only a fish that had the exact bone pattern of the skull of an amphibian, but it also had lost the opercula series. Now, they're the bones that fish cover their gills. So it had lost the opercula series. So it had a purely amphibian-like head, but it still had fin rays at the end of its digits, at the end of its uh, limbs. Um, April 2006, Nature, absolutely fantastic. I was able to see the specimen when I was over in Chicago last year and take some photos and study it. It's an absolutely amazing specimen. They've got not just one, they've got 30-odd specimens of it. Enter this fish, Gogonesis, which we discovered on our Museum Victoria expedition in July last year, and it's on display upstairs in the cabinet and was published in Nature only last week, November the 9th issue. But basically we were able to push back the origin of the tetrapod limb plan and the origin of the spir these big holes on the top of the head, the spiracles, as a breathing accessory organ back even further into the fishes than were previously thought. Um, it's got these whopping great holes on the head, which is called a spiracular opening, which in these early amphibians and fish like Tiktaalik become the otic notch. Eventually that's going to become the way that all vertebrates subsequently would hear. It's going to become your ear or your tympanum. New technology comes to play with the invention up at ANU with my colleague here, Tim Senden, and that's Professor Zhu Min, who's the head of the Institute of Vertebrate Paleontology in China that's working with us on this project. The world's finest ultrafine CT scanner. We can get down to one micron slices using this tool. Now, a synchrotron can get down to a third of a micron. So we're looking at you know, just three times coarser than a synchrotron. A synchrotron is a hellishly expensive piece of equipment and very hard to get to use because of the cues and the costs. Whereas this thing, they built it for a couple of hundred thousand dollars and we can use it all the time for free. So we're getting a remarkable amount of new detail. Um, we're looking at Gogonesis and its brain case in far more detail than ever seen before of any type of fossil. This is why the paper was published in Nature. Uh, and you can download a CT scan and see the anatomy of this fish in stunning detail. You can play with it, it's free. All you have to do is log on to Nature. And I'll show you a couple of the CT scans that we've produced. And this is why we've got teams coming from China and all around the world to be part of our research project at the moment. Because we have a sh probably a short window of two years where we have a jump on everyone else in the world before they catch up and get similar technologies. Come on. This is a lovely one that shows the inner ear of the fish. The semicircular canals, and we'll just rotate that. You can also get volumetric measurements. So it not only shows you the anatomy in great detail, but you can calculate the volume. And we've been using this to look at the evolution of whales as well. Some of the, the whales that Eric Fitzgerald has been working on, we were able to calculate the volume of the cochlea so we can work out the frequencies of echolocation in the very first baleen whales. That's another paper we're hoping to submit very soon. So, I mean, you know, this is the way science advances. You can either go out and find new fossils or you can go back and use new technologies. But either way, you're creating new data and new evidence that, that mounts up in support of different theories. And this is the way science advances. Come on, they're a bit slow, these movies. There we go. So just summing up, you know, the emperor's new clothes. The, the thing above is an early Devonian sort of you know, Lake Devonian tetrapod called Acanthostega. The thing below is Gogonesis, which you can see on display upstairs. It's a three-dimensional, perfect Devonian fish. The bone pattern matches one for one with the basic 
cheek and skull pattern of these uh, early amphibians. It's really just the proportions that differ, that's all. Those of you that uh, bought my book, and I haven't got the slide here, but um, I did a comparison of the skull of a, a skeleton of Gogonasus with a human skeleton. And one for one, you can see that back in a Devonian fish, many of these bone patterns have already evolved. This, for example, is the humerus ulnar radius, the same three bones we have in our arm. Sorry about these little arrows. And that's comparing it to Tiktaalik, the one that was on the cover of Nature. And they're, they're virtually, you know, almost an identical pattern. In other words, you know, when you look at the human body, a lot of these patterning that, that exists now goes right back to the Devonian. And the only thing that's changed is proportion. There's one or two bits of fine tuning, like development of wrists and, and finger bones, but the wrist bones are already there in the very first amphibians anyway. So to conclude, you know, there's now over a billion fossils in museums, universities and private collections around the world. Something like three million in this institution alone. It's wonderful bits of evidence for evolution. I don't think we need to sort of waste time often debating with creationists. We just need to point out to the rest of the community the overwhelming evidence that already exists. And it's, it's a lay down misere when you think about it. And these fossils combined with the modern molecular clock data, radiometric dating, uh, new technologies like CT scanning and so on, have really nailed down the critical stages of vertebrate evolution without any, any doubts whatsoever. More work obviously needs to be done with things like soft-bodied organisms, uh, creatures that don't preserve well in the fossil record. But for creatures like that, when we're dealing with you know, the relationships of worms to, to cephalopods and mollusks and things like that, we've all got modern molecular data that we can actually come up with hypotheses of how they're related and then we go back to the fossil record and look to see what evidence we've got. Often these things that don't preserve well in the fossil record like worms will have a subset of themselves like their teeth, um, selecodonts and other um, scales or bits that they have in their body that do preserve as microfossils. So in some cases there are other ways of looking at these problems. But I, I won't go into it, it's a, it's a really complex area. And finally, looking at new work on the mechanisms of evolution, heterochrony, evolutionary development work, helps refine our understanding of the actual processes that drive evolution. And I'm pleased to say a, a book that we, Ken McNamara, who's a, a world expert on heterochrony, wrote in 1998 called The Evolution Revolution. Anyone read that or had a look at it? Um, the new edition is coming out March next year, completely updated with all the latest work. And it's written as a simple book for the layperson, um, devoid of hopefully complex terms. Finally, the new technologies are giving us deeper insights into the restudy of all critical fossils in evolutionary transitions. And with the increasing technologies that are advancing all the time, it's going to give us even more ways to go back and investigate fossils and investigate that whole evolutionary um, process. And I'd like to leave it at that and thank the skeptics for inviting me to come and talk and, and uh, I hope the meeting's been a, a great success for everyone. Thanks. What's the question? Yeah, anyone got any questions? Or uh, before Lynn talks, uh, uh, you guys want to pick the questions? Uh, yeah, it's a fellow right at the back there. Yeah, John, did yes. you talk about uh, the origin of vertebrates? I didn't. No, I, I, was, I could talk about the origin of vertebrates, but no, I didn't. I, that was just a ringer. It's a fascinating area, though. There's so many new discoveries coming out of China. We've got Milo Kunmingia. Zhongzhang ichthys, Haiku ichthys, we've got you know, all these early fish back in the early Cambrian now, so that is a fascinating area. Yep. Sorry? Yep? Uh, a couple of questions. The first one is if the name of any person at the ANU who might be willing to talk uh, to camera skeptics about um, the, uh, the, 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 the XC team. Yeah, to, uh, Professor Tim Senden, who's um, at the um, Research School of uh, Physics, Department of Applied Mathematics. And uh, the second question is just briefly, if I may, about the, the, um, the discovery of this, uh, uh, I believe, soft tissue material in some dinosaur fossils. What, yes, what, yes. What the process is there and how they remain preserved? Well, things like biomolecules can be preserved if they're sort of encapsulated. Um, when we look for ancient DNA inside fossil skeletons, we often go to the root of the tooth or inside one of the digit bones. And molecules can be preserved in a desiccated state and then they can be replicated. But it's the amount of information you get out of them that determines how useful they are. So you do get residues of collagen, of blood, of even DNA and parts of DNA, but it's the utility of them in what they tell us that's often debated. 
but yeah, it depends on, again, technology, what sort of resolution you're going to get out of these things. We tested one of these go-go fish several years ago for collagen and got residual collagen. So the bone is, is bone, it's unchanged, you know, and the cell's there, and there's bound to be residual organic material. You've just got to have the, the degree of resolution for your instruments to pick it up. Uh, yep. I just uh, wanted to, um, you to confirm something that I believe that I heard somewhere, it might have been Paul who was mentioned on some science show, that Tiktaalik was actually looked for very specifically in yes. specific locations. Yes, so absolutely. Showing the predictive power of scientists that deal with the past. Well, well this is the way it goes now. In, uh, Ted Daeschler and Neil Shubin, who discovered Tiktaalik, had a very clever program where they were looking for the missing links between fishes and, an, and land animals. And they said, we need sediments of this kind, of this age, and preserved in abundance that haven't been searched. And they drew this big map of the world, and they came up with Arctic Canada. And they went there. They did two field seasons. And the second field season, they discovered a single lens with about 30 complete skeletons. They managed to dig out quite a few of them. But it's ongoing work. Some of the biggest ones are three metres long and the smallest ones are about this big. And uh, so they've not only got the whole complete fish, the whole complete skeleton, but they've got the whole growth series. And it's just a fascinating uh, discovery. Is that, the way, is that the way paleontology now? That's the way we're working too. I mean, we've got two major ARC discovery grants, so we can basically target the most important sites we want to go and visit and then have a big attack on that site looking for something specifically. Now, I say with Liao Ning, luckily China's got a whole big population there, and there's several sites in North China that have these Liao Ning deposits. So they realize the value of them now, so they're continually quarrying them and mining them, and uh, people that find something get rewarded um, through the science academies and institutes. So because of that, the good fossils are now turning up and staying in China and not being smuggled out on the black market anymore. Do we know why um, dinosaurs sprouted Feathers? That's an interesting question, but Tony Thorburn published a paper in 1985 where he said if you look at the growth of a normal chick embryo and you give it retinoic acid or vitamin A at a certain stage of its development, you can reverse the patterning of reptilian scales and feather cover. So you can have a chicken that's completely covered in scales but feathers on the legs. So it could be just a, 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 a simple as thing as a dietary shift. Um, we know that going from scales to feathers is a developmental easy thing to do. It just takes retinoic acid, so it's not a big step. When, uh, when was the change from cold-blooded to warm-blooded taking place? That's a very good question. Um, Warm-bloodedness probably evolved several times, certainly in mammals, independently from when it evolved in, in dinosaurs and, um, and birds. As for dinosaurs, there's still a, an open debate, and I'll be very sceptical about this, that not everybody believes dinosaurs were necessarily warm-blooded. And when we say warm-blooded, um, homeothermic, a lot of people believe that big dinosaurs might have been what's called gigantothermic, that just by their sheer bulk and size they could have retained a higher body metabolism without having the same sort of internal heat generator that mammals and birds have today. But certainly when we look at thin sections of their blood vessels in their bones, we see that most dinosaurs have a metabolism that's somewhere intermediate between reptiles and modern birds. And uh, it's, a, it's a very interesting question, and also because of the fact that we've got dinosaurs living in polar climates, dinosaurs living in tropical climates, that they m may have had a, a whole range of ways of metabolizing. Um, there's still a lot of work to be done in that area. About the evolution of feathers and all the yep. stages um, from the scales to feathers. Yep. Now, what about the evolution of flight? Has anything recently been revealed there, how it went from gliding to powered flapping flight? Absolutely. I mean, with Archaeopteryx, there's been an enormous number of studies done on it and published in Nature and Science and various places. Recently, there was a paper um, that they've analysed that it had flying ability, it could flap its wings, and it could actually take off from, from standing. So as other people argued, Archaeopteryx could only climb trees and glide. But biomechanical studies that are done that test the strength of the legs and the muscular abilities um, are fascinating sort of works. And, and they've actually proven now that Archaeopteryx could take off from the ground and fly, had had the ability. So that means, you know, it, it's, it's practically a bird. Uh, people still call it the first true bird that's retaining a, a primitive rep reptilian dinosaur skeleton. But being able to take off and fly... Um, is, is the first point, and then once you start flying on a regular basis and you're landing, your skeleton becomes rapidly modified into the, the standard bird pattern. Because if you're flying and you land, think of all the pressures that are on your hips, your legs, 
And that area evolves rapidly then, and that's the sort of suite of skeletal characters that defines all modern birds from that point on. So you're saying Archaeopteryx was already powered by so the stages yeah. of the evolution occurred before Archaeopteryx? That's right, and the stages were the experimental forms, like these four-winged raptors and four-winged and, and, and gliding um, dromaeosaurs. So they had feathers and they had large arms. In fact, if you look at the arms of Archaeopteryx and you look at the arms of Velociraptor, they're exactly the same proportions. There's no proportional difference. Archaeopteryx doesn't have bigger arms than Velociraptor. It's just got bigger feathers. So they're the sorts of differences. Thank you very much. And please accept this small part of our presentation. Oh, right. Thanks. Thanks. Good.